there's a Casey Neistat video of him running like 10 miles in the city. And every mile he goes, feeling good. I still feel good. This is the one mile check-in and I feel great. 10 and change and I feel great. 12 and I feel great. 16 and I feel great. I feel great. Mile 21, still feel great. I gotta run 12 miles today. I'm training for a marathon, so. All right, five in. I'm, now I'm tired, I'm over it. All right, that's eight. I'm freaking tired. 11, one more to go. I feel like death. If I were to go out and ask the average person, are you happy? I think a lot of people would say, I'm happy. But then if I said, are you satisfied with every aspect of your life? Are you feeling totally fulfilled? I think the answer for a lot of people, and I can tell you with my own clients, a lot of people are dissatisfied at work. They're, a lot of people are dissatisfied with their relationships. A lot of people are dissatisfied with, with themselves and how they treat themselves and their own sort of mental health or physical health. And yet we just sort of put up with it. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this idea of being satisfied, but not, but, but like, why don't we push ourselves to be, to be great? So in the 1960s, Martin Seligman took dogs and put them into two groups. In group one, he took a dog, he harnessed the dog up, put it in a little room, and put a lever in that kennel, and he shocked the dog. And he kept shocking the dog until the dog bumped into the lever. And the dog learned that when it hit the lever, the shock would stop. What's important here is that dog learned that it could control the shock. In the second group, the dog was given the exact same shock. In fact, the shock given to group two was identical and actually controlled by the dog in group one, right? So when the dog in group one hit the lever, the shock would stop for group two. So the experience of pain was the same. The difference was the dog in group two had no idea that he or she could control the shock. So then Seligman and another researcher, Meyer, take those two dogs two groups of dogs, and they put them into a new experiment. And in this experiment, there's a long kennel. And on one side of the kennel, there's a, an electrical current that can run through the floor. And then there's a small divider. The dog could easily jump over. And then the other side, there's no shock, right? There's, there's, the floor looks the same, but you can't run a shock through it. Puts the dog on the shocking side and shocks it. The dogs that were in group one, the dog that had the sense of control goes, oh my God, the floor hurts and jumps over the barrier, right? The dog hasn't been taught to jump over the barrier, but the dog knows that it's, it has a sense of, of agency because historically it learned that it could bump into a lever and stop the shock. So when it gets shocked in this experiment, it just jumps over the barrier onto the safe side, no shock. The dogs in group two, the dogs that didn't have a sense of control, get shocked. And instead of jumping over that small barrier, they just sat there and got shocked. Just, they just took it, just would whimper. And what was crazy is Seligman and Meyer would actually have to go in there and pick the dog up and jump over the barrier with the dog to show the dog that there is safety. Only after showing the dog that there was safety did the dog learn, oh, I can escape this pain. So it was absolutely seminal research at the time. And everybody goes, oh my gosh, this means that when people experience distress for a long time, they essentially learn that they, they, they can't help themselves, so they stop trying. Now, thinking around this has evolved, and, and, and researchers now don't believe that the dog learned to be helpless. What they believe is that the dog never learned to help itself, and the belief is that humans are the same. We don't know that we can make things better for ourselves unless we learn that we can make things better for ourselves, which is really, I, I think, is really important when you think about a, a life that's in pain, but also a life that is that is mediocre. When we're looking at our lives and we go, you know what, I'm satisfied, it's good enough. The, the question we have to ask ourselves is, like, are we just not able to see over that barrier? Are we just not challenging ourselves to jump over that barrier because we don't know how to do it? Are we just sort of naturally sitting here being shocked with a mild current, unwilling to make things better? <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but, uh,
Yeah. Say it again. Do it again. Vanilla. 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 Good job. <laughs> Vanilla. Roman. That one for me. Rio, you, you look sticky. So what does this mean? Like, how is this actionable? I think it means that we have to take responsibility for gaining information, right? The dogs weren't able to jump over that barrier until somebody actually picked them up and showed them how to do it. Well, in life, no one's going to forcibly show you how to do things. You have to go out there and seek the information. You have to search for it. And so maybe in the different areas of your life, the areas in which you're not totally satisfied, maybe spend time finding people that you believe are successful in that space. Maybe go, maybe go read, maybe go learn, maybe you gotta acquire information so that you can really learn how high is that barrier. And in some areas you're gonna say, you know what, it's not worth it to improve that area. But I, I bet for most of us, there are things that we can do that are achievable that would make us happier, more satisfied, more fulfilled. Like how is this actually actionable? How is this actually actionable? You, know, you wanna say hi to the camera? Hi! I got my dad's Nino camera. Camera!